Hello and welcome. I'm John Cloud Kaiser from Materials for the Arts, and this is another of our Third Thursdays, which are chances for the public to meet artists that may art make artwork with reused materials. And that's what we're all about at Materials for the Arts, is taking materials that are leftovers and seeing them as art supplies that we can transform into amazing art projects. And today we're excited to be joined by our current artist in residence, whose exhibit will be unveiled virtually this evening, TJ Mohammed. Welcome, TJ. Psyched to have you tonight. Um, see, TJ, uh, you gotta un unmute <laughs> yourself. Though. There it is. Good. How are you doing, John? Super glad to have you here tonight to walk uh, walk us through your show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank to uh, Materials for the Arts and of course to everyone who is joining us today uh i wish to say thank you all for you know the gift of your time and this exhibition i mean means a lot to me because of um the point at which this exhibition is happening in my career as well as also um at the same time you know the current climate of the world and america itself you know with black lives matter and all of this happening so, I mean, it's a very significant show for me, and I hope it becomes a monumental piece in the hearts and minds of, you know, our audience and everyone that get the chance to um, meet the show virtually. Well, we're excited to, to be able to, to walk through it with you tonight, even though, yeah, exactly. Right now, we're, we're not able to, to, have, to see the physical exhibit, we are lucky enough to have had this amazing uh, virtual gallery tour created um, by our own uh, Stephen Sabunya from Materials for the Arts, who's, who's created this, this tour that, that after our presentation today, you can go back, you can actually watch it, you can walk around, you can move around in there, uh, you can even use the, the Google uh, goggles and the, the, the cardboard where you're able to put it in and watch it. So it's a really cool opportunity to check out TJ's amazing installation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I guess we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go right in there and, and TJ, literally, if you don't mind, just we'll, you'll guide us into this virtual world and, and take us on a tour of this exhibit. And, and then, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so while we wait for Blaze to I mean bring up the screen, um, I would say um, this concept of I mean the, the work showing in this show with the title "See Phase One, See Something, Say Something" has um, a lot of connotation to do with what is happening now, the climate, the state of the world, and also. America at la I mean at large plus what is happening with COVID-19 and um, Black Lives Matter protests and movement. So what I was trying to do with this um, with the title of the show in relationship to the works um, is to create um, you know like a piece or a body of work that references um, place and time. So you could see phase one reminds us of what is happening now and has this, um, as the world begins to open, that we are opening in phases. And I chose phase two because my very first solo show in Ghana um, in 2003 at the National Museum of Ghana um, was entitled stage one where I donated the proceeds to the children's uh, block of the Kolebu Children's uh, Hospital. And, you know, so I wanted this to also be a significant aspect, although it's not my second solo show, I wanted to choose this title like phrase to sort of number it, to remember this as a form of reopening the world. And we thank God that we have been, the world has already been open more than our phase two now. And then see something, say something also has a relationship to do um, with um, my demographics, like where I am now. Um, and also the responses that I've seen and also in the buses, like when you, if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. And 
The question here for me, um, I don't know, sometimes it becomes troubling when you see a lot of protests and movements happening for uh, that we wish to create, um, you know, this atmosphere of um, immigration freedom, systemic racism, uh, social and um, environmental justice. I wonder whenever we see stuff and say, is the world listening? Because there is a lot of uh, saying that has been happening, you know, since since way back 400 years ago. Mm. But the question is, is the world listening to us? Is the world listening to what is happening to its climate, to its environment, to humanity, to blacks, to minority, to the poor? You know, not only in America, this is a global problem. So, but it is, it's very, very sad to see America that sees itself as, you know, I don't know if I should also say it, like the powerful nation and then having its leaders act like they are, you know, um, you know the weakest, you know, it's very sad to see stuff like this happening. And also I wanted to highlight the idea of demographics. So there's this, um, Nostalgia, there's this nostalgia of create using um uh like using culture and traditions to create all of this body of work where I'm referencing and highlighting the work of um Anas Armiao Anas, who happens to be a Ghanaian. So all of this is part of the concept of the work. And you know, when we walk, we start working, as you see on the screen, these are the works uh, that are part of the show. And if we jump into the virtual tour, I would walk you through. Um, I mean, I'm just amazed by the, the compositions of, you know, the we're gonna see metro cars. I'm seeing handcuffs. I'm seeing yeah. uh, beads and hats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, well, okay. Here we go. So we're going to start from the beginning and. Awesome. So this is that virtual view. Beautiful. Yeah. And again, um, I would like to uh, mention that out of necessity and the conversation, I would be uh, speaking more about myself, but I am a strong believer that um, we all are not uh, without uh, other people's, you know, help and support, you know, the community and families that have been supporting uh, my career and also supporting materials for the art with all these um materials and objects for artists to work with. Um, I also like to acknowledge all of that. So as the uh, conversation goes on, if I don't mention, just know that I strongly believe and acknowledge um, your support. Um, yeah, so we are looking at um, a piece where that I call um, See, so it's one of the pieces that I created in New York. So that is the second piece instead. So it's called See Something, Say Something, uh, number two. And I would, it consists of Metro cards. There's a chandelier in it. There are handcuffs, there are beads, there are fishing wire. And the idea of using handcuffs um, came in later when um, I started thinking about, um, you know, freedom because the keys to the handcuffs are in the middle of the installation. Mm. Mm. And I would also thank um, Arnaldo Morales, who is an incredible bronze artist who built a machine for me to install on, the, on top of the installation. So when you play it, it sort of spin and how there is uh, an uncomfortable noise that it makes, which I'm referencing um, you know, the train rides on, on, on a not good day. So there's all of this happening in, in, in times where you have to just put your phone on hold because the train is either coming or going. So I'm trying to mimic all of these experiences. And the keys and the handcuffs, handcuffs are already open. So this is an idea or a positive affirmation that 
we are free, you know, we are free. So let's not um, adhere to uh, not being free as, you know, as oppression happens, it, it, there's this idea of making people feel uncomfortable so they cannot like move on. So there's this, this idea of we are free. So, and I like to also reference the works of Derek Adam, Adams here, where he depicts um, black and colored people, you know, enjoying, you know, having the very good uh, side of life, which he referenced that you would not see it commonly, you know, on TV and et cetera, but we are enjoying what we want. And the, uh, we would just move a little bit from um, the chandelier piece and then gradually walk into the installation that you see now, which is also, so I wanted to talk about the Metro cuts uh, because these both works uh, relate. Um, this is the These first. are mirrors. Yeah, this is the first one. And the idea of mirror is coming in not because I had it originally in my, you know, sketch or in my thinking process, but the idea of mirror came in by itself when I saw it in the space. And I acknowledge Omar when, you know, I was looking for, you know, I saw the mirror, um, you know, in March, back in March before the solo show, I mean, the group show, um, I embraced the mirror and incorporated. So I like this idea of, uh, support that you get from an institution whenever you have an idea how this idea is being supported not only by the institution but also with the staff of the institution um, so it happens that i slowly engage with the mirror and like i mentioned during the studio um, visit or the open studios um, whenever I pick a material, I like to explore this material. I like to work with it over and over and try to understand the aesthetic uh, beauty of the material and also research to know about the history of the single material. Then I learn about the collaborative um, history, which is the community history. So my work is about personal and community stories and histories where I just oppose um, objects and you know think about ways but to present this um uh this this objects that have its own history so what you're looking at is a metro cards there's nets various kind of nets in various colors and the idea of you know having the mirror also references some of the mirrors are standing which is you know mimicking what we see in the city at the same time, I was thinking about creating a piece that would be, you know, um, uh, a piece which would not be selfie free, you know. Um, so when you stand in the piece, I like the viewers to just look around, you go up, you you just, so there is a performance happening when you engage in with the piece. And when you try to capture those moments of this performance, it would capture yourself capturing the moment. So, you know, there's this idea of people are watching and mirrors are beautiful. And as you look at the mirror, you are looking at yourself. So there is this idea of reflection of yourself within a group of people. So you have to present yourself. And the group of people here is what we see, the collection of Metro cards, which is collection of um, people's history, people's cry, people being fired because of the Metro card, because you go to swipe the card, you miss a swipe and you miss a train and you get to work late, you've been fired. People missing moments of capturing or seeing their babies being delivered due to a train delay, which is not your fault, but it is the fault of a system. Again, when we say something, it's the world hearing. You know, so there is a lot that, you know, we would unfold as we evolve in the show. And yeah, so we could just walk slowly in it. And I I know I refuse to talk a lot about this MetroCard installation because there is so much to talk about it, talking about it in the concept of, um, you know, a body of work. So the 
I mean, on another day we could discuss it or open up to, yeah. So when you walk from the Metro card, you are walking in or you are walking into a piece that um, also raises a lot of questions. Um, but at the same time, this piece is capturing time. So it's capturing time. And what I see um, or what I'm looking at in the in the black, in the word black is you are looking at a word that says black. But again, the only black you have is in two spots. One is in the very middle of the piece, which is the heart in, you know, installed in the letter A. So it raises a lot of questions, but again, it's referencing a mural that was done, uh, that was part of at, the, at Foley Square in front of the courthouses. So here, what I'm doing is I'm trying to say, um, let's have a conversation um, about this, um, this culture. And it's referencing the mural, which is downtown. And some people would not have the opportunity to see it. So I wanted to document this moment into a sculptural piece. And what I'm also looking at in this piece here is um, I'm thinking about, you know, moments where um, artists would strategically, you know, switch or play with objects and materials to be able to see it differently and to create a conversation. Um, it's also, you know, um, sort of creates this idea of uh, multi multiplicity of meaning, you know, um, like you create a demo or you create um, uh, a miniature version of a product. So it is an act of repetition, but again, it is referencing what already exists. So it's like you have a sketch that you are showing, but then you are showing this sketch or a model or a sample of an existing piece. Yeah, so there's this connection of traveling that I wanted to engage. It's just so it's it's so beautiful, you know, just seeing the the mm -hmm. live large version of it at, at Foley Square, but then you know, you just you know seeing the detail and the thought of, of the meaning that goes into each of the letters is is yeah. is just it's just gorgeous to me. And it also speaks to the you know, all the the work you've done with different fabrics and, and patterns mm -hmm. and, and symbols. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, before I maybe unfold, you know, to talk about a little bit about meanings um, here, um, I would like to acknowledge all the companies and all the individuals and the artists that work, you know, tax crew, WXY, percent for the arts, New York Department of Culture, Materials for the Arts, all these organizations that are that were part of this um you know monument that referenced a lot of history and holds all of these meanings um also you know i i was i i designed black but uh sophia dawson designed live and then patrice Payne designed um Marta. so all of this put together makes yeah i acknowledge all of them in this piece um and when you look at black, black signifies uh, democracy, unity within and diversity with strength. Um, L, I have strength, I have royalty, I have a collective um, energy. A is where we have love, referencing LGBTQ, referencing everybody that is part of a struggle. And what it means to be black is not only the color of the skin or having to be born in America to side with uh, Black Lives Matter, but this is a global affair. So I'm thinking about all this ethnicity and minorities in the piece. C is about royalty, seeking inspiration from the past, and then referencing the African burial ground, which is um, a block away from the mural at Foley Square. Um, K is about freedom, and when you reference in colors, uh, the letter K represents color. So this is saying, it's like you are poetically saying black freedom. And then there's a symbol, also their symbol of beauty. So you're saying again, black beauty, black is beautiful, black is free. 
black is freedom and then we are all going to die which is the um the symbol in the pink which is the symbol of death you know symbol of passage and all of that also you know they are saying this is a global affair um if you remember i mean uh, a lot of people might not remember but a few people from african muslims remember when the chief imam of um the national mosque of kaulak senegal wore the black lives matter mask which is a symbol and it's a very very powerful statement to have an imam of an entire group of muslim the tijaniya tijaniya i believe it's in millions have millions of followers globally you know like a lot i don't know how many but it's one of the it's it is the biggest islamic um because it relates to sufis and and having the leader or the imam wear this mask you know this is a very very big statement that we all have to come in collectively to support this you know this act of resistance this act of saying it's enough this act of saying we are already free do not make us feel uncomfortable you know and you don't have to be from america to respond Amadou Diallo was born yeah Amadou Diallo was born in Africa but he was killed here you know in the Bronx I remember painting his mural with Howard Diallo um his aunt at um where he was shot at Wheeler Avenue it was sad to you know lament on all of these things happening yeah so when you walk slowly from uh the word black um you are entering into another piece it's like now you are traveling to another continent you are moving from new york city talking about global issues and now you fall into ghana so what we are seeing here is a piece that um that was built through um my connections and what i wanted to um respond to um with my birth country Ghana and a lot of times you know artists um we travel across continents across uh, we meet different cultures and religions and what happens is that um there are moments where we create out of you know just passion of wanting to have an image exist and there are moments where we create based on the respond or based on what we want to voice out you know so that is the activism aspect of art so what is happening here is we are looking at beats and i call this um anas armiao anas um tribute to ahmed swa um, ahmed hussein swa swa uh, swali so um anas is a very yeah he's an undercover journalist from Ghana and why did i mention Ahmed uh, Hussein here Ahmed Hussein was born um on December 5th 87 that way and then he was killed by people that a lot of eyewitness saw but the law enforcement have not bring them in I mean to justice these are civilian, I mean, people were mufti dressed, they were wearing just ordinary dress and shot this guy because he was working together with an undercover journalist in Ghana. And like, he just shot, like they shot him three times, he passed away and the number of hats represents his age. So the number of hats are going to be um, 32. Um, and when I, reach out to um anas you know with respect to all of this that is happening and he sent me a lot of materials to research into and now i'm beginning to see you know layers that i i even didn't think about when i was creating this piece and as worse um the beads you know in front to cover his eyes and faces but yeah so they're like, they're like hats with beads hanging from them yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Like a so, mask. he wears a hat and then it's covered the face is covered by the beads so cool. and you know conceptually reading the idea of beads in um i mean in arts 
there are so many layers to it what but one of the one that stand out is be it a symbol of community they are symbol of seeking community strength besides anything else you are seeking spiritual strength your physical strength so anas is seeking all of this conceptually when you look at it but again you find a body of people who are going against what he's doing and i remember when he was talking at a ted talk he mentioned it, and you could tell this is the lamenting aspect of a being. You know, we have to support this group of people to name, shame, and jail, which is a slogan for Anas. But yet you find people who do not side with that. And I think artists that are outside of Africa also have to respond to, you know, issues affecting Africa. Because if we are unable to speak out all of these issues affecting Ghana and Africa, then it becomes troubling and maybe the biggest scam that would happen to African Americans living in America or abroad. Because everybody wants to go home. Marcos Gavi returned to Africa and Black Lives Matter, Black Lives uh, being Black Panther. All of this is reminding us of where we come from. So we that know the secret of the continent have to voice it out. Not that we are exposing, but we are exposing to create caution and awareness before our brothers and sisters resettle in Africa. So they're already aware of the bad knot. They're already aware of what is going on. So they could take, you know, take their steps carefully. And, you know, there are bad knots everywhere, but we have to also talk about our own self and have people understand and support the works of people like Anas. When you move from this piece here, and here again, we look at the hats, there are various um, forms of art and ages. Anas transforms himself to a kid. The, he could be a student, he could be a mad person, he could be a woman, he could be a prostitute. Today, you see him being an imam. So all of these changes and, you know, the Ghana police honestly did not do well on this aspect, you know, because you saw it and then up to now, it's 2019, it happened. But up to now, we haven't heard anything about the killers. We hope to hear it soon. So, yeah, that is a message that I give into, you know, humbly giving it to this group of bodies, people. When you move from the heart, you will be walking into another piece that is reminds you of the same person, Anas Armiao Anas, but here the title goes, Anas Armiao Anas, see something, say something. I'm referencing, um, what I'm doing here is I'm referencing this idea of diaspora into um, uh, Ghana itself. So I'm borrowing a word that is very popular, a very popular okay. phrase in New York, which is see something, say something and infusing it in the context of uh, Ghana, in the Ghanaian context. So Anna, what Anas is doing is he's supporting us, he's supporting what we are doing. But what I'm saying is we should also support ourselves and support him. Because when we see what we are seeing and saying, let's just keep saying the act of repetition becomes an act of remembrance, an act of resilience an act of refusing and also an act of engaging and embracing. So once we begin to do this continuously, we would uh, be able to achieve um, this world that we are creating, you know, the utopian um, idea of culture and tradition. And the eyes as you see are pe from people from the streets of Ghana, Accra, uh, visitors that came to my studio in Ghana, from hand painted by you. Yeah, hand painted with acrylic. Um, and this thing's like this. This is like we're we're seeing like a giant, basically yeah. in a sense, t-shirt that's like 30, 40 feet tall, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The 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 height is about twenty seven feet, and <laughs> it's, <laughs> so, it's huge. So, when, so it's huge. It's like you are looking at people and. I know there's been a lot of reference here. I would also acknowledge the tailors of Cantamanto market, which is uh, one of the largest markets in Ghana, um, who collaborated with me here to start this piece in 2013. 
and I was able to complete it during my residency at Materials for the Art for, for Arts. The stitches are stitches of t-shirts that I collect from Ghana all the way to here in the US. And then the eyes are also sourced from people in New York and a lot of them from the African communities. And as we walk, yeah, with this piece, you could go around it. It's a complete T-shirt, yeah. And as we go around it, we are going to bump into uh, one, the last piece here. And uh, the last piece we are looking at, okay, so um, the, the virtual capturing captured it in red, which is very powerful to me. I, I like that, yeah of capturing it in red it's like something is burning and here um coincidentally i mean something is burning you could but this is a human being in, in the middle of it there is some spiritual reference in it uh, that i i'm able to read now you know referencing um uh, islamically we say abraham i mean ibrahim or abraham when he was you know ordered to throw in, uh, when he was being thrown into fire and what happened, but still he was comfortable. But at the same time, I'm saying this piece is, you know, responding to environment. It's entitled, um, it's yesterday eating today's tomorrow. Um, it consists of acrylic on canvas. The baby is painted in acrylic. Maybe in, you know, after this, we might see it in slide. And then there is also, um, the red you see that red light it's the um it's a led light that changes in color that gives you the impression that this baby is breathing and she see it like it like, like glows and like undulates the light kind of glows and glows uh, out it's just beautiful yeah yeah thank you john and yeah so what happened what is happening in this piece is the oh, the um original idea of this piece is to have a, an installation that would consist of, I don't know how many kids or how many babies, but the idea is to install it in a very dark place with all the kids, I mean, the kids um, sleeping. They are all under one year old, I mean, under between one and two months. So if um, I would like to, you know, solicit here that if you have a picture of a baby under, maybe under two months, let's say three months, under three months sleeping, I'm very happy to, you know, so for the, I mean, for the entire installation, it would be baby sleeping in the dark um, and then the lights would be just be glowing. It's referencing what we are doing today. Uh, I mean, are we destroying the environment for the future, which is the future is the one the babies that are being born today are we eating or destroying their tomorrow which is the future and yeah so at this point i would um leave and open up for questions and you know thank you so much for walking with me through this uh pieces and yeah thank we'll you. start with john <laughs> man thank you so much uh it's just beautiful and and I'm glad to be able to share it with people by by walking through this virtual um, experience here. Um, I know we have a couple slides that we could even show just to, so people could see a couple last images here before we mm -hmm. open it up fully to questions. But folks, you can uh, ask questions in the chat function on our YouTube, and we'll, we'll try our best to answer them. Uh, but man, my take on it is just you know, each of these materials that you're using is so imbued with meaning, you know, the Metro card, the net, the handcuff, the t-shirt, the, the beads, the hat, you know, the, the crib. It's, and, and I just, it's such a beautiful, simple poem of, of assemblage of materials that, that ends mm -hmm. up having such a, a deep meaning that I keep unlocking every time I look at it. And, and uh, so thank you so much. You're um, welcome. Yeah. I, I'm not, I think we'll get a chance to look at a couple of slides here, but otherwise, maybe if anyone has any questions, well, now's the time to ask them, and we'll see if we can we can answer them for you. Um, oh, here's some of the net close-ups of the net and the metro cards. Yeah, 
Yeah, and again, you know, as you know, this size just move and changes, we'll just uh, jump into while um, we answer questions. And uh, folks on Instagram, please, when you send your questions through YouTube, I'll be able to see it. We have the link in the um, comments. Um, and yeah, what I just want to say is, uh, you know, um, the multiplicities of meanings um, uh, brings out this dialogue, like this universal dialogue and makes a dynamic conversation as this monumental pieces are created. So there are a lot of like meanings goes on into this work and they are all layers upon layers. And it also unveils, you know, the aspect of, you know, our daily lives, which moves from, from winning or, amb you know, having ambitions to, um, to losing or to uh, the, yeah. Oh, okay. No, I thought you were talking, you know, from, you know, from winning to losing, you know, from life and death, and then the idea of, you know, passage and material history to incorporating also symbolic meanings. And they, I don't know the Kente and Adinkra symbols are, uh, they are also celebrating their 400 year history in Africa. So there is this um, connection of um, histories and you know age aging there's also an idea of aging in here yeah oh man it's just beautiful and and uh these these images that's nice to be able to share um so i mean one question i have just and i think you explained this but just to get a sense of it so so you, these metric cards i mean you must have literally thousands of metric cards how long have you been collecting them for yeah um i started collecting metro cards in 2013 uh somewhere maybe september maybe august late august that was when i started and the whole um idea of collecting metro guard started you know it's just i'm fascinated by collecting objects and people's histories and stories so if you don't see me collecting objects that holds all of these histories i'm collecting stories so it started 20 2013 when i first came to new york then I collected a few. 2014, I started very seriously, collected a whole lot. And then at some point I like paused and then slowly collecting. But currently, uh, both pieces that you see um, have close to uh, 40, maybe 4,200. The last time I checked, I when I moved my studio back home, I mean, uh, in the Bronx from Materials for the Arts, you know, due to lockdown, um, the last time I counted what I have, I had 3,500 in the installation. Nice. And then later I kept adding and adding and people's donating. Like I know Tara Materials for the Arts, if there was an award, she would be the highest donor of MetroCard and my friends from Instagram and social media, friends and families who also support. So awesome. I got a question here from uh, Paul Humphrey. The question is, he says, I know your exhibition was inspired by some of the issues of the moment with Black Lives Matter, but can you tell us a bit uh, about what was part of your original inspiration for the exhibit versus what you added? Oh, okay, <laughs> that's a good one. So um, the original one was the Metro card. So all, but whenever I walk into, um, thank you, Paul, again, whenever I walk into, um, into a residency, I see it as a learning process. So sometimes I go in with an idea, other times, no. So, but for materials for the arts, I went in there openly and the window of the studio prompted me to work on the Metro card. But I knew I would have a solo show after the residency, but I wasn't thinking about what to show because, you know, it's a process of working. You are working and having different materials. You know, you don't know what artwork would tell you they are ready to for the public to see them, you know. So you have to have a day of outdooring, you know, whenever you are not ready for to have the baby, uh, presented to the public you have to postpone the naming ceremony 
So the original idea was to create an installation of Metro cards and, you know, work with people's history and, you know, just walk around the, the, the warehouse and see which objects would call on me, you know, would, and I have a lot of ideas in my sketchbook, but there are times I don't go back to them until a year or more. And thank God for lockdown, I've been able to, you know, dig out a lot of ideas that I have and work with it. So it, it was only about people's history and material history, if I should give a straightforward answer. Yeah, the idea I wanted to do for my show was to play with people's history and also material history because I was in a warehouse working with materials that are donated by um, people. So how do I represent this and maybe create objects out of it or create body of works? And then, you know, I allow the universe and the materials to dictate and the conversation also very important played a role in changing. That is why um, Black Lives Matter came into it. But, you know, uh, there are times when um, um, artists would find so many ways to extend their vision by inventing different ways of working. So once when, when you begin to you know, invent or uh, extend your vision to be able to see beyond what you are seeing, um, when you want to do that, it becomes a challenge. And there are moments where the community has to respond before you also, I mean, act. And there are times where you have to act before the community also respond. So there's this interchange and um, this dialogue between the artists and the community. And in our time now, I mean, talking about back in the uh, people like Pollack, um, when he wanted to you know, extend his vision to see what he wasn't seeing or to have people see what was not, he invented the drips. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Christos who would make an unimaginable projects in um, the public. Uh, you know, the, the process of working constantly with the community, with the, um, I, I mean, the politics involved in, you know, all of this becomes a moment of seeing beyond what you, were, you would see. And some of these projects would fail. Uh, there are so many ideas. of this would come out and sometimes you know like christos it would take 10 20 years before um these ideas or permissions are being executed so it's it's just you and the universe and the community that was a deep question paul i mean i would have never thought about it. but i mean I, I mean i've always been impressed by how you you really worked you know the idea of community uh mm -hmm. practice into your work whether it was you know when i first encountered your work at the Children's Museum, you know, thinking about that or, you know, working with textiles where you're actually working with different, uh, you know, women across countries and try interviewing them, finding their processes. Um, yeah. So many diverse and, you know, thoughtful ways of engaging, not just sculpture, but community practice as well. I mean, um, so. Yeah, thanks. Um, here's a question here um, from, from Stephen, um, is there a theme that is constant within all the pieces? Uh, yeah, the, the idea of repetition is constant mm. in pieces. Yeah, um, thank you, Stephen, for your question. Yeah, so the um, the idea of repetition starts when you walk into the installation. I mean, from the entrance as you walk and keep moving, there's this idea of repetition in all the pieces. And I see a uh, read repetition as a form. There are so many ways to I read repetition. And in the pieces, sometimes, uh, most of the time, I read it as as a spiritual, you know, as a as a form of spirituality. So repetition becomes a, an act of uh, spirituality. And it would move to see, um, to reference 
overconsumption and also overproduction. Um, once you get somewhere in the middle of the piece, heading towards the hats. So there's this idea also of um, repetition is changing its meaning to um, uh, to address the issue of um, overconsumption and over uh, production. And as you move on towards the end of the show, which is where you see the um, the t-shirt, the t-shirts also have repetition of t-shirts. Mm -hmm. And then, but when you uh, take um, add up all of this, it comes back to the last piece, which is the baby. So these repetitions happen. And if you want to see repetition in the baby's piece, I would say just uh, look at the way the lights begin to change. There's this act of repetition in the in the mm -hmm. shape of colors and the moment and capturing. This a very a virtual um, recording was able to capture a moment when the repetition was happening in still. And these are moments in our lives where things become uh, repeated patterns. But again, we are able to pick out just one out of it. Just like we are addressing um, social justice and um, Black Lives Matter movement on all these killings and shootings, we also again see the act of uh, repetition of history in the piece. So in the word Black, you could see repetition of symbols, which would move you to repetition of history or um, repetition of what is happening now. What, there is this line that goes through the all of the letters um and then when it gets to a the line goes up which is showing the graph of death that is happening so there's that idea exists in the pieces and it goes i think yeah Blaze is moving the mouse to give uh, for that idea of it yeah so i think yeah to circle out one it would be a repetition but it changes and becomes different multiple meanings and create dialogues yeah and and again that that question was from steven savonia who, who actually created this virtual <laughs> uh tour of materials for the arts gallery where we're seeing tj mohammed our artist in residence uh art show here so we're super excited does anyone have any questions you're welcome to ask questions and we can have a chance to answer them right now uh in the meantime uh we're really afterwards inviting you to use this interface at materialsforthearts.org um, there's actually a link right here in the youtube uh, where you can actually tour this exhibit on your own watch around if you have the google cardboard lenses you can even put those on uh to check out the show so we're, we're excited to have at least this opportunity for you to experience his work. Yeah. Um, was, there a, was there a moment during this process um, that surprised you? Were there any moments in the process that took you down a different path than you originally anticipated? I know you'd spoken to that, but I know Materials for the Arts always does that. There's <laughs> yeah, always random that. materials in you. Yeah, yeah, it gives you. Um, um, so again, the question again, because I wanted to respond to it in one, but there's so much, so much that comes in mind. Yeah, the first question is Was there a moment that surprised you in the process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the process of this, um, I mean, creating this show, uh, the surprise that literally um, changed or added more layers to the piece was um, George Floyd's, I mean, mm. uh, death. That is uh, one. In Materia, it would be the chandelier that I met. For, I mean, um, it, it happened. I was just going to the studio, you know, from the restroom going to the studio. And this lady, before, you know, the place closed, and there was this lady next to the studio who was very confident enough and knew, you know, felt I was working there and asked me my opinion on, you know, what I thought about, you know, the lights and everything. And right there, I was, I began to think about, you know, like conversation and what would, what made her, you know, talk. And now we're having a conversation over a piece that would have already existed in another life. She could have taken it without 
asking my opinion because I don't know where she would take it to where she what she wants to do with it. But I gave her my advice on it and said it was a good idea, you know, to I mean take it and look at it over time. It would create something for her. And we just left each other. I came back the next day, it was still there. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe she prompted me to use it instead. So I just took it and put it in the studio. Mm -hmm. Slowly, I imagine it turning into a piece that would rotate, um, you know, because I already had the rotating machine built by um, Arnaldo, um, which was initially to be used at the at, uh, Children's Museum for mm -hmm. one of my pieces. But I also just had it in my stuff. And I was like, okay, I will connect back to it. So this kind of surprises happen. And the objects also, you know, spark all of these um, surprises. Um, a sup uh, an object surprise would be of the beats. When I started thinking about working, I mean, creating um, the beats, it was the gold beats was what was available in the studio. I saw it. Oh, there was this colorful ones that I was also had also come in, and I would ask about hats. Today I will make a Harvard hat. Tomorrow I'll make the British flag, the American <laughs> flag. Yeah. So all of these are moments of surprises that you know when one becomes very conscious of it, a lot comes out of it that turns out to be a positive. Yeah. Wow. And then I guess there was like kind of a part two of that question. Were there any moments in your process that took you down a different path than you originally anticipated? Mm, yeah. Again, it would go back to the um, the the hat. Um, the original idea of the hat, if you could reference back to my open studio video the um, presentation I gave on the hat is different from what you were seeing because um, it was in my studio right there behind me, but I was going to use the hat for, I mean, together with the chandelier to create a monster, to create something that looks like a beast that would move. Mm. But yeah, but you know, the more you work with the material and you allow yourself that freedom and not being so rigid, you a lot of inventions happen. And mm -hmm. having to be in a studio or you know, converting the whole room, I mean, the whole house into um, a studio also becomes a constant, I um, mean, the invention constantly happen and that you don't have a stop point. So all of this begin to happen, and I was like, "Oh, there is a um, a coat rack, or uh, what we call it? Yeah, that's a rack, clothing rack. Yeah, next to if uh, a lot of people might not see it, but heading towards the bathroom, going to the offices of the of materials for the art, where the art classes happen, there are these rack, clothing racks, right there." I mean, there will be clothing racks next to the office or the workshop classroom. And I saw this um, clothing racks maybe somewhere in the back where we have the oh, metals and stuff, but it didn't spark to me anything. It didn't respond to me until when I saw it coming out of the bathroom. And I was like, oh, no, there is this shift of idea. How about I use this? Then I took it to the studio, experimented it uh, one Tuesday, and I I, th I felt it was working. So right there, I had to change. And when you um, were go reference to that same open studio presentation, the chandelier wasn't supposed to move. It wasn't supposed to spin. It was <laughs> supposed to be a, a static or a statue object, but you know, reading into it more and thinking about it conceptually and also referencing aesthetic beauty. And I felt, oh, you know what? It is a good idea to do, to have this switch. So there are moments where that happens a lot. And 
I don't know about other artists, but that is what I enjoy in the process because I enjoy if it's a paint if it's in a painting, it would be what we call the happy accident. Mm -hmm. you know? So it also exists in installations. I mean, it's it's like when you walk into the exhibit. I mean, literally, it's like you walk in and there's this this kind of the sound of moving parts, and you see the chandelier spinning, and then you know there's this whole canopy of of mm. metro car nets and you walk through and then as you round the corner not only are you met by this you know larger than life yeah you know, piece of clothing but there's this glowing you know undulating in the corner and then you round and you find the the baby you know it's very move the whole there's actually lots of moving uh parts that in 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 the exhibit which i think is pretty cool um yeah i guess Thank maybe you. you kind of stumbled upon that kind of just happened like that in a way yeah yeah it just happened in a way and if you remember when we spoke about oh uh, when do i want to start installing uh for the show all that while i didn't know what like how to install it or what yeah. to do yeah but i just started walking in the piece and thinking about the pieces i took measurements thinking about what would be okay to tie a knot where can i screw and you know thinking about okay how can i create this show to have the viewer experience um you know an idea of walking because the 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 very first metro card piece is going to spin you into the piece and as you walk along you when you get to the 10 you would have to pause you know so there's this um idea there's this performance that i'm you know indirectly um directing the viewer once you walk into the piece it spins you in you walk you have to take a moment relax this is new york city take a moment relax take it in there's a lot of confusion and everything going on there's a lot of loudness going on but before you get to the end and make a right to go to the baby and t-shirt piece you have to pause and if you look at it in the sense of driving, whenever before you make a turn, you should stop. There is a stop sign. So yeah. these, these hearts are going to push you to tell you, no, take a moment and you know relax before you make it right. So this, I was just thinking about how to playfully you know, work on this. Well, you know, it's interesting because I have a question actually from uh, Harriet Taub, uh, the executive director of, of our not-for-profit Friends of Materials for the Arts, and she has a, she was asking a question about, you know, how how it feels to install at Materials for the Arts gallery because it's like we have our gallery set up, so it's like you have to go through this gauntlet and walking through all these different tunnels and things to get into the space, mm -hmm. and we want you to see the work of this awesome artist. Um, but yeah, how was that experience? I mean, you were kind of describing it already, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the experience, um, if Omar would remember, I, um, again, Omar is, um, uh, Omar works, is a staff of materials for the arts, just for the viewers that don't know Omar. Um, so Omar One was, of the curators of the gallery. Yeah, the curators of the gallery. Yeah, so when um, I started working on the T-shirt, I know he came in one day, you know, so a lot of time. Omar, I've met Omar in the studio many times. So we've had beautiful conversation about artists, arts, and, you know, what is happening in the world now. And we were discussing how to install the T-shirt piece. And I was like, I, honestly, I don't know. I, I haven't thought about it. But if, you know, so he started having ideas we would put it in the end where the vent but then um he was with his friend i think is it um i forgot the name his the other uh friend's name and he was like oh we'll put it by the uh on the corner like the junction the l shape and he was like no the vent is there and this is huge um how do we play with it so yeah i mean there's the exhibition or the gallery space itself I mean, direct you to doing what you like. It would suggest to you multiple ways of engaging with it. If you see the very first drawing I made of the gallery, this T-shirt piece wasn't supposed to be here. And then, yeah, I was going to put it where the Metro card was instead. But I didn't want it to there later. I wanted to create a tunnel when people walk in. 
and then the black life's mother uh the black piece would have been next to the baby you know so the space itself suggests to you multiple ways of using and engaging with it which is beautiful because um it challenges you and gives you other options to think about you see well we also like to i think part of it just inspire people to realize like everyone can create their own gallery in different creative ways and mm -hmm. we all have spaces to show our art um, yeah. i got another question here from uh fatu mata uh, magasa do you consider mm -hmm. yourself an activist or use your art as a form of activism um i ask because a lot of your art addresses injustice and social responsibility um and you know, maybe yeah, maybe tell us a little more about your journey as an activist, she asked. Yeah, um, so it all started as an artist. Like, I was trained an artist, you know, and, and then I graduated, like, the, a painter. And then later, I started working with various mediums. So by 2007, I my work changed. After my very first solo show, after about four years, my work changed a little bit to between after four years it changed. But by 2010, I started thinking about, I mean, my surrounding. And by 2013, my mom, the project I did for the women celebration of women, the one I showed um, during the group show and also showing at as, um, Katona Museum. Uh, that was when I started thinking about those ideas. So that is when I started thinking about art and activism in the pieces. And I began to respond. 2013 was when I started the activism clearly, because right there, because I was working, making pieces for my mom. And then I started thinking about the community and other women and how to respond on issues around me in my community where I was born, which is, I mean, where I was raised and in Nima, in Accra. You could Google it and you would enjoy Nima. You don't have to miss Nima when you go to Ghana. Yeah, I-M-A, that is the spelling. Um, it's a beautiful place with a lot of inspiration, millions of artists. Uh, we have Musa Swala, we have Rufai, there's a huge, it's a it's a whole community of artists and creative people who are always working for the community for free wow. that is how my studio is open i mean my studio is open free for everybody so this idea continued and what um again fatu uh fatumata what i realize is that I mean, you cannot be an artist of these modern times and not think about your community or the world around you. So it changes automatically. I know it is very troubling for some artists to be able to adapt the change because I have friends who are battling with that. So it becomes troubling for you to do that switch and to respond because it is an uncomfortable turn that you have to make. And again, when you are making works in that angle, your audience slowly changed. And sometimes it is very challenging because financially it becomes a problem for you if you don't have grants or residences that would support you with spaces to do all of that. So sometimes from personal experience, we are scared sometimes as artists to walk into this kind of field. But again, be conscious of the world around us. We have been sent to this planet to create, like to create. So we are prophets. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are prophets. We have to voice it out loud. That is why I'm saying, say whatever you see, just say it. And as you say it in a repeated pattern, it stick to people's memory and mind and make, you know, um, like the leaders and the quack leaders uncomfortable for us to see this change. Like Nelson Mandela said, we have to, uh, uh, we have to create, you know, uh, the, the, the world we want to see. You know? So we have to do this and artists have the power to do it. But spiritually, 
about 98% and physically 2%. That is what I believe. Yeah. Man, I'm so, well, I'm so thankful for, for the energy you're putting out there with your art, creating it, bringing it to all of us right now. It's, yeah. it's so meaningful. There's a comment. Someone says, uh, arts girl, art girl really says, TJ, I like the, the beads um, becoming hair hanging from the hats, and it makes you feel like, there are all these people or the spirits of the people. Uh, so that energy, people can feel it. It's, it's yeah, amazing. That's a spiritual aspect. And again, to add up to Fatu Mata, um, next month I've been invited to speak in the Social Justice Summit in Milwaukee. Uh, it's part of a program that happens annually um, at No Studios. Uh, John Riley, the one who is it, the writer of uh, 12 Years a Slave, yeah, the hits uh, space. Yeah, so I'm going to be speaking there. And all this is happening due to the channels that I've been able to like change in my work. And I think we all have to respond to what is happening around us. Well, it's certainly been an inspiration. And, and we're so thankful to have you as the artist in residence to have this exhibit and to give us this personal tour this evening. Uh, and folks, thanks for joining us. Again, Materials for the Arts, it's New York's premier reuse facility. We have a whole warehouse full of materials that have been donated, leftovers, that we now donate to artists and to schools. So thanks again for joining us. I'm John Kaiser, and we've been joined by TJ Mohammed. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, TJ. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening, and have a great one. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.